Hi there, welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, Government Senator for Queensland, Susan MacDonald. News.com political editor, Samantha Maiden. Lawyer and former Liberal staffer, Danya Mani, who has spoken publicly about her own sexual assault allegations. WA Labor MP, Anne Ali. And artificial intelligence expert, Kate Crawford, who's appearing at Sydney's All About Women Festival this weekend. Please make all of them feel welcome. Now, later in the program, we'll speak to author and feminist Isabel Allende. At 78, she's still fierce, still fantastic, and still having sex. You can replace, you know, energy. You can replace the energy with laughter and marijuana and, um, <laughs> I don't know, companionship, kindness. But so, humour, good humour helps a lot. Our first question tonight comes from Luther Utai Kamara. Thank you. There are reports today that uh, <clears throat> Defence Minister uh, Linda Reynolds called Brittany Higgins, quote unquote, a lying cow. Now, uh, if a senior public servant or a uh, business executive uses that language in a workplace, it could very well lead to disciplinary action. Uh, so the question is why are the leaders of this country, uh, that is, ministers and parliamentarians, held to a lower standard than the rest of us? And Ali. Um, thank you, Luther, for that question. And I think you reflect the tone of many Australians who are watching what's unfolding in Parliament and thinking exactly the same thing. If that was me or if that was my workplace, I know what would have happened. And why do parliamentarians, why are politicians uh, above the standards that... that, uh, that Australians are held to? Why are they not being held accountable? Why do they keep getting away with things that we wouldn't get away with? You know, when we're elected to represent our, our constituencies, we're elected as one of the people, not as being above the people, not as being uh, different from the people, but as being one of the people. And as being one of the people, we should lead by example. I completely agree with you that what we are seeing over the past three weeks does an incredible disservice to our democracy, does an incredible disservice to the idea of representation and that those of us who hold high office in Parliament uh, reflect the wishes, the concerns, uh, the diversity and the standards that Australians expect and that we expect of Australians that we expect of our nation. Susan MacDonald, I note that Linda Reynolds, your, your colleague in the Senate, did not deny having called Brittany Higgins a lying cow. So I think one of the other things that I would say to you, Luther, is that the Senate... Uh, I've been in the Senate for nearly 18 months. And one of the things that I have found most surprising is uh, how robust it is. And, in fact, uh, looking at the school kids here tonight, I think about the school kids who line the top of the Senate chamber to come for question time. And I have to tell you, I don't think it shows us in a good light. The last two weeks have been incredibly tough on Senator uh, Linda Reynolds. She is a very ca uh, capable minister, but more importantly, she is an incredibly compassionate woman and a great leader. And this has rocked her to the core because she feels so strongly uh, for her team and the women in her lives because of some experiences in her past. So, Do you think I, her behaviour demonstrates that, if indeed she did say this? I, I think what her, her behaviour demonstrates is that she's very human. And I know that I've said things that I regret and she has apologised to her staff uh, for, for the words she used. But I do think um, the... the, the the process of Parliament and the performance of the Senate is incredibly tough and she's a, a, a very kind and decent person who was caught saying something that she has said later that she regretted. I think we should do well to reflect on what makes us human and some of our frailties. Well, to be honest, uh, there is nothing human or compassionate about calling an alleged rape victim a lying cow. Yeah. <laughs> I do note that Senator Reynolds, in her defence, has claimed that she wasn't referring directly to the rape allegations, but to um, what she said about what, what followed, essentially what happened in the workplace in terms of the support. But I'll tell you who'd had a bad week in the office. Mm -hmm. It was the staffer who mm -hmm. got raped, not 
Linda Reynolds and she should apologise to Brittany Higgins for those remarks and she hasn't. We need to note that it is an alleged rape at this point. Dania Marnie, you've worked in Parliament, mm. you've dealt with bosses. Um, what do you make of these reports that Linda Reynolds said those words in relation to Brittany Higgins, whatever the context? Well, the first thing that I have to point out and that I regret, you know, in relation to the comments that we've just heard, um, from a parliamentarian federally is that this conversation is far too focused on enabling, justifying, forgiving, allowing anything, any conduct, no matter how sexist, no matter how misogynistic, from any person in political office. At what point is enough enough? A lying cow, really, that, that that's meant to be language that we're meant to look on as a, a woman's kindness and compassion. But is, is this exclusively about the Liberal Party or the Coalition, though? I mean, are we talking about a broader all. political culture? I think we're talking absolutely about broader political culture. I think, you know, it's been unfortunate and sad that we've not seen people standing up from all sides of politics, whether that be the Labor Party, um, whether that be the Nationals or, or the Greens, and saying that they need to take ownership mm. of this issue as well. This isn't just something that occurs within the Liberal Party. But I think... For there to be an environment that exists in which an extremely senior woman in politics felt that she'd be able to say that somebody who is extremely traumatised and has come forward with rape allegations is a lying cow, is a reflection of just how broken our parliaments are, of just how misogynistic our parliaments can be, and of the gaslighting and abuse that parliamentarians are prepared to put at the feet of survivors. Because it's one thing to say in her statement, oh, well, I didn't call her a liar about the allegations. Well, you're trying to smear her about everything else. What does that say about the respect that women in the most senior offices in this country have for women who are coming forward about these things? And, and I think it's something that our senior female politicians really need to look on the inside about and they need to question, have I internalised misogyny? Am I a part of the problem now? And frankly, I'm sad to say that Linda Reynolds is part of the problem. And, you know, as our questioner has said, usually there'd be disciplinary action. There needs to be disciplinary action. Kate Crawford, you, you work... <laughs> Kate Crawford, you work in big tech. Uh, this is an extremely male-dominated environment. How do you observe this conversation the, and the events unfolding in Australia right now? Mm. Well, I mean, it's been extraordinary, I have to say, that I think Australia is having a moment. I think this is a time in the country where we're all stopping to say exactly how is this occurring in the highest offices mm. of the land. And it is part of a broader structural problem, I have to say, across male-dominated industries. And certainly I see this across technology as well. Just in the last few weeks, we've been seeing a, a complete scandal playing out at Google where we're seeing senior women being fired. And again, it's the same gaslighting. It's the same undermining of, of women's authority and of their voice and of their story. Every year, our trust in politicians seems to hit a new low. Ministers used to resign over small things, but today ministers hardly ever resign or step down. My question is, do you think the PM should launch an independent inquiry into the rape allegations against <coughs> Christian Porter? I think we just need to be clear, it's a single allegation, not multiple. Uh, uh, Christian Porter does strenuously deny this allegation Understand. that has been put. Susan MacDonald. This is a tragedy and I feel so deeply, um, both for the woman who's concerned and for her family, I, I can't begin to imagine. Um, we do have a system of, of justice in this country. We do have a police service that is well-resourced and the most capable of understanding whether or not uh, some evidence needs to go to trial, and they have closed the matter. Um, I, I don't think that this is an easy subject, but we can't have a situation where allegations equate to guilt. And I think that... Uh, the, the Minister has um, made a full statement and I think that we need to have some justice in the law and the rules of the land because otherwise, um, w you know, do we become a kangaroo court and a, a court of public opinion? What about justice for, for the victims? All victim? of us who have um, uh, family, people in our lives who um, may ever be unjustly accused, uh, that we want them to have a right of reply. That is that is our legal system. But we, we keep talking about justice for the accused. What about justice for the victim? What about justice for the victim? We've... Uh, <laughs> you know, 
I am, I am, I am infuriated by this because I'm sick and tired of the lip service that we hear in Parliament about hearing victims' voices, about listening to women, about respect for women. And right now is a moment. Right now is a moment for the Prime Minister to show leadership here and action not just words. And what did he do? He came out and he said, oh, well, I've asked him if he did it and he said no and that's enough for me. And then suddenly you've got all of these men invoking justice, justice, justice. Where was justice and procedural fairness for all the victims of robo-debt? Yeah? <clears throat> can, can we just be clear, though, about what you're actually asking for? What, if you're saying you want action, what is the action you want? I want an inquiry. I think that this what, what is a kind serious... What kind of inquiry? I think, well... First of all, the police haven't closed it because South Australian police are still determining whether there is um, a coronial inquest to be undertaken. And so that, rela that, that relates to, to, the to, death to her of this death. individual. This is not in relation. And to, that may to the well be. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Hamish. And that may well be um, a process that um, opens up. Um, uh, some more evidence or, or that either exonerates... OK, um, but, but you're saying tonight you want action from the Prime Minister. I just want to establish what exactly you want. I would like the Prime Minister to establish an independent inquiry. The fact that the police are not pursuing the matter for... For, for practical reasons, does not preclude or prevent the Prime Minister from undertaking an inquiry into a very serious allegation that... And that inquiry uh, will either exonerate uh, Christian Porter and prove his innocence, as he is, um, as, as he is um, saying, that he is innocent, or it will prove otherwise. Either way, this is a serious, serious allegation and it needs to be treated so seriously. Just briefly, Dania, what kind of inquiry or investigation do you want specifically? I think that there should be a High Court inquiry. We're talking about the Chief Law Officer of this country. I think it's appropriate as a result that the High Court is the body to examine the veracity um, of, of my friend's um, allegations. And I think, you know, it's insulting to suggest... But just specifically, though, what do you mean? You're talking about a retired High Court yes, Justice... Yes, re retired High Court this? Justice. Perhaps um, former Justice Bell would be an appropriate choice to examine these allegations. And for the purposes of that inquiry, the statement that my friend completed but was unable to sign because of COVID, of no fault of her own, because of COVID, should be deemed admissible for the purposes of, of that inquiry. And there's precedent for a deceased individual's allegations to be to be heard and justly inquired into in, in a legal process. I mean, that's what we saw uh, in the George Pell case. We had a deceased complainant and due process was able to be upheld in that instance. So, Maiden? Yeah, look, it's a great question that you have asked, and Noah, and I think that uh, I actually share the concerns of uh, some politicians, including the Prime Minister, that there is actually a problem with setting up a quasi-judicial process in Parliament to rule on criminal matters. And I think there is an argument that that's a poor precedent. So personally, I mean, what I would like to see is a coronial inquest. I think that there is a strong argument that the justice system has failed uh, not only uh, the alleged victim, but Christian Porter, because he has not been given the opportunity to be interviewed by police, to provide an affidavit, uh, to have witnesses come forward. So... Can, can I just ask Susan McDonald, do you think that's important from Christian Porter's point of view? You're sort of saying here tonight you don't believe there should be any kind of other investigation, mm. but should he not go through a process where his version of events is formally put? Mm. Well, I, I think that we have a process which is the police. Um, we put a lot of faith in them to do these kind of investigations. Well, they've never interviewed Christian All Porter. The mm. time, no, because he was not given the allegations prior to reading them in the newspaper. Well, so the delays in that process on the and Friday. the insufficient so, resources... Just, just hold on a second. We'll just hear this. Uh, I do think, though, that if we have a, a police process, we have a, um, a fabulous justice system in this land that has served us well, uh, if we want to change that, then that's another conversation to have. But, you know, I think it works well for us and they have deemed that there was not... Uh, that the matter was closed because there wasn't enough admiss admissible evidence. But the evidence. point I wanted to make, Hamish, was this, right? Christian Porter has a right to the presumption of innocence. Mm. He also has a right to his good name. Mm. So let him give sworn evidence, right? Now, a coronial inquiry is never going to rule on the criminal matter. That, that, that can't really happen anymore. But it would provide an opportunity for him to give his version of events 
for a coroner to ask him questions about it, to ask questions about, you know, why this woman was released, um, you know, after she'd been, been under medical care and then forced to, as I understand it, quarantine at home by herself for two weeks. She rang the police during that process where she was obviously very distressed and she said that she didn't want to proceed with the uh, complaint. She cut her hair into the same style that she had had when the alleged incident occurred. Very upsetting and disturbing to people around her. And she uh, died by suicide the next day. So clearly all of these events, you know, of, of the, the quarantine and the discussions with police, they're all connected. And that's something that a coronial inquiry can look at. And crucially, that's something that her family wants. And her family told news.com.au today that they will support what they described as any inquiry, whether it is the sort of inquiry that you're talking about or a coronial inquest. And that's what I think should happen, because I think that Christian Porter should be given that opportunity. And, and if, as he says, this never happened, this is a shocking allegation that has destroyed his life, he should have the opportunity to say that and put his hand on the Bible and, and give sworn evidence. Uh, this next question is for our politicians. Uh, it's a video who, from a young woman who you may have heard about or read about. She started a petition to change consent education in schools. Her name is Chanel. Hi, Suzanne and Anne. My petition for more holistic consent education in Australia from an earlier age is getting a lot of support from members of Parliament in New South Wales. Since testimonies are emerging from Queensland and Western Australia, I was wondering if you'll support educational reform in your states. And Ali? 100%. 100%. Um, we do need to start at an early age with um, educating young people about consent. Uh, I would include in there about coercive control. I'm part of a campaign around coercive control as well. But education is not the be-all and end-all. Let me put that very clearly. When I was 17 and I was sitting on the grass with my girlfriends at school and I said, you know, if a man ever raised his hand to me, I would knee him in the balls and walk out the door. And I went back when a man did raise his hand to me. I went back several times when a man raised his hand to me and I did not walk out that door and I did not knee him in the balls. So education is part of it, absolutely, definitely. We do need to educate young people. We need to educate adults as well because much of um, uh, many um, ideas about relationships and healthy relationships are also learned in the home. Uh, so education, yes, but also um, the, the increasing of services, uh, having somewhere for, for women to go, uh, for victims to go, women or men, um, having them to uh, somewhere for them to go. Cultural change happens generationally and it happens very slowly. And, and just if I may, Hamish, on the last point, with respect, Susan, I'm quite astounded that you're saying we're only just having the conversation now and that in parts of the country the conversation hasn't been happening. I've been having the conversation for 30 years. I'm actually quite tired of talking about it and I just want to see action. Education to begin with, but a whole range of support services as well. And, and if, I could, if I can add from, to from that Susan too. McDonald, because the question was to, to our two politicians. Mm. Do you support the idea of changing education around consent? Yeah, absolutely. I think that across the nation we have different um, definitions, but at a more practical level, I think that there are young men and young women who have who are really struggling to understand now what does the interaction look like, what's OK? And so I think it's, it's urgently needed and I think education's a great start. I want to bring in one of those young men who's in the audience tonight. There's a bunch of young men that have written in to us about this issue. Joseph Anderson, I think, is uh, in one of the back rows. Joseph, how much are you talking about these issues around consent with your mates at school? Yeah, definitely. We are sort of brought it up last week where it's big in the news and we're deeply concerned about it and... Yeah, we want to see, like, how this goes and the reforms that can be made and, yeah. Is it confusing to you? Does it need clarification? I mean, how, much, how confident do you feel with what you've been taught so far around these ideas of consent? Well, definitely not confident enough for boys around Australia because it's obviously not working and there's obviously an underlying issue that needs to uh, be addressed. And, and do you have a view as to who should be teaching this to you or communicating this to you? Is it your parents? Is it the school? Is it politicians or, or people sitting having a debate? I mean, what, what's your view? Well, I feel that I'm probably not the best person to ask that. I feel someone with a more advanced sort of knowledge, like people on the panellists should 
comment on that. Like, yeah. Okay, Kate, who should be teaching young guys like Joseph that genuinely want to know? Mm. Well, Joseph, first of all, thank you for talking about it. Mm. And I think in some ways you're kind of really exemplifying why I think young people are so far ahead of this debate. Like, even talking about the fact that consent is confusing, it is something that has to be negotiated, in many cases entirely non-verbally. Like, these are things that young people are talking about. When I think about where the problem is, it's not with young people, actually, it's with the baby boomers and beyond yes. generations, and particularly at the moment... So if the, if the grown-ups are leaders, confused, how are they going to tell young guys like precisely. Joseph what the answer is? That's exactly right. right, Hamish. And so this is another reason why I say, mm -hmm. rather than always putting this at the foot of young people, we have to educate them, we have to train them better, mm -hmm. we should be looking at leaders. We should be looking at the Prime Minister and saying, how are you going to show that we're actually going to take action differently this Sam time? Sam Maiden? Look, I've uh, got uh, two boys um, that are about your age or a little bit younger, and, like, I know there's lots of great young men and a lot of great men uh, out there thinking about these issues. On one level, I don't think consent is really that confusing. Is it really that confusing? I'm not sure that it is. But if, um, if society at large is having a conversation about yeah. the definitions, right? Yeah. Mm. I mean, for a young person that's grappling with this for the first time, presumably, yeah. that must be something that they have to consider and take in. That The grown-ups are all debating this, right? Mm. Um, how does a young person get clarity on it? Yeah, and I'd love to see a whole program, you know, talking to people such as yourself about those issues. One of the things that concerns me as a parent uh, is the issue of pornography. So uh, for all those who think I'm some terrible prude, I have no problem with pornography, adults watching pornography, but I do think that there's a problem in society now that it is so available on the internet uh, that it is really, uh, in many ways, the first sexual experience people have is seeing that stuff. And they're having that experience before they're actually dealing with a human being. So perhaps when I was growing up and, and people my parents' generation, I'm not saying for a minute that sexual assault and consent issues didn't arise because they did, but when you were having those first experiences, it was with a human being. And my concern is that a lot of the pornography that is available is very violent, it's very aggressive. You, you know, you've had women like Chanel talk about the fact that that has an impact in terms of the sort of sex that boys expect or think is normal. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, whatever people want to do when they're consenting adults, that's their business. But if that pornography is having a corrosive effect at an early age in terms of expectations, what women want, um, you know, how to actually have a good time, I think that's a, a big problem. Okay. I agree. I think that is a really big issue. And I, too, have sons and we and a daughter and we discuss these things. I'm, I'm very big on talking about talk what about women porn? want. You talk, about, you talk about porn? I know. It's really distressing to my sons. They would really <laughs> rather that I didn't. And they do it on television. But I think, <laughs> I think it's an important conversation. We've got to get to author and feminist Isabel Allende. Now, we've put your questions to her from her home in California. She'll be sharing her wisdom with Sydney's All About Women Festival this Sunday and our first question for Isabel tonight comes from Clara Smythe. Uh, um, are we sending a confusing message and mi mixed messages to girls? On the one hand, we're told not to tell little girls they're very pretty so they're not objectified. Then on the other hand, the media rewards women by enlisting those who have spent thousands tens of thousands of dollars on plastic surgery to increase their chances to be chosen for a reality show. And I've used an example, um, MAFS, Married at First Sight. <laughs> <laughs> Isabel Allende. Yeah, it's a bit of a conundrum. Well, that's one of the many things that the feminist movement, especially the young wave of feminists, has, has been challenging. Um, I don't think there is anything wrong with being pretty or feeling pretty, being self-confident and feeling good in your body. But uh, you don't have to change anything. And then that shouldn't be uh, something imposed from outside. It should be something that you feel inside. Isabel, some young women seem to be cautious about calling themselves feminists. Why do you think that is? Because men have been very successful in depicting women who are feminists as hairy bitches that don't shave their armpits and they they are main haters that is not true that is that is a cliche invented by the right and by the by some males and it has sort of caught on so women young women especially feel that it's not sexy to be a feminist 
Well, I'm telling you, call yourself whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Don't call yourself a feminist, but do the work. OK, Isabel, our next question comes to you from Steve Bentley in Ipswich in Queensland. We know men abuse power. Throughout history, there has been no respite from male rulers abusing power. 2020 showed us just how bad this can get. If women rule the world, would we have war, weapons of mass destruction, billionaires, overpopulation, religion, poverty and homelessness, climate catastrophe, massive habitat destruction, abusive pornography, domestic violence and violent crime in general? Women are not responsible for the items on this list. Well, I would like to meet this gentleman, really. He has summarized what patriarchy is all about. Uh, when, when I talk about feminism being a, an uprising, a struggle against patriarchy, I'm not saying against men, because we need men. We need men like that gentleman and like my son and like the new generation of young men who are also fed up with the world as it is. And it's not about replacing patriarchy by a matriarchy because we don't know how that would work. But to have a management of the world in which men and women in equal numbers and with equal, equal power would make the decisions. Uh, Isabel, you say in your new book uh, that you were an angry child. Uh, what was your mum's reaction to that? Didn't she start taking you to doctors? Uh, yeah. Uh, they thought that there was something wrong with me. Maybe I had some tapeworm or something wrong with my brain because I was a, a weird kid. I mean, I didn't fit anywhere. I was rebellious. I was kicked out of the nun school when I was six. My mother thought that that her daughter wasn't going to have a very happy life. She told me once, she said, look, you can do anything you want, but do it discreetly. Don't make so much noise. And my reply was feminism without noise. What that, would that look like? Isabel, I know you won't be watching Australian politics closely where you are, but we are having a big debate in this country about the treatment of women in our politics, in our national life. Do you think the solutions lie in getting the gender balance right in the buildings where decisions are made, or is there more to it than that? I think that's the beginning. That's where we start. Um, without that um, critical number, nothing much changes. The pendulum doesn't move. Uh, Isabel, our next question is from Mark Darcy from Rye in Victoria. Isabel Allende, your stories are full of spiritual references. Given that, I wonder what you think about the idea of romance and desire being spiritual rather than requiring a physical expression or outlet. Wow, that's a lovely idea. A lovely idea that I should explore. For me, unfortunately, that has not <laughs> happened. <laughs> but, but I'm, especially at my age, I'm totally willing to explore that. I'll talk to my husband tonight. So how important then is the physical? You said that you're 78 now. How valuable is that to you today? It still is. Yeah, there is a lot of demands on my husband. <laughs> so, so give us an insight into the future, Isabel. Does, does the sex get better, more beautiful with age, or does it get more difficult? Difficult, of course. But you can replace, you know, energy. You can replace the energy with laughter and marijuana and... Um, <laughs> I don't know, companionship, kindness, but humour, good humour helps a lot. You've talked, though, about getting divorced in your 70s. Has it surprised you, the capacity for love and for renewal in these later decades of your life? You know, when I divorced, I was 72, and I really thought that I would spend the rest of my life without a male companion. Because at that age, it's almost impossible to find someone that would be interested in me. Older men, they look terrible, by the way. They think that they are entitled to women 30 years younger. What are they thinking? They are crazy. <laughs> but for some reason, there was a man who heard me on the radio and he started emailing me every day. He was a lawyer from New York, a widower. He emailed me every day, in the morning and in the evening. So finally, he sold his house, gave away everything it contained, and moved to California with two bikes and his clothes. 
which were very dated, so I had to throw them away. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we've been living ever since together, and we have both changed. We have both changed a lot. And it's been a wonderful, how could I say, renewal, discovery. It's like, like a new life in, in many ways. And I'm happy that it's happening. Isabella Yende, on that note, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, please come and say hi in person next time. OK, thank you so much. Take care. And that's all we've got time for tonight. <laughs> please thank our wonderful panel, Senator Susan McDonald, Samantha Maiden, Dunya Marnie, Anne Ali and Kate Crawford. Please thank you. <laughs>